Coaching Soccer Weekly, episode 345, Defensive Changes During the Game. Entertaining, educational, and inspiring soccer content to help make you a more effective coach, player, or soccer parent. Hello, and welcome back to Coaching Soccer Weekly, presented by World Class Coaching. My name is Sega Verbinovich, and this is the podcast devoted to bringing you cutting-edge methods, techniques, and tactics for coaching soccer. It doesn't matter if you're an experienced coach who has been training teams for many years, or if you're new to coaching and working with the team for the very first time, there's something we can all do to take our coaching to the next level. Welcome back to the show. Uh, oh, the games were canceled this weekend. The league wasn't ready. Um, and then we also have a bye week this week. So, uh, <laughs> um. It's it, it's frustrating. Uh, I'll tell you this, especially this bye week, uh, which means that essentially teams are going to have an advantage because they played an extra week before we get started. So while they're be they're going to be in their second game, we're going to be in our first game. So it's a little frustrating, to be honest. I was really really excited to get back into games, and what's great is that. Two of the teams start this month, and then two of the teams start next month. So it was a really good way to kind of ease back into the league with having just two teams in the same location at different times. So it was just, it was a really good way to kind of start everything off. Um, we can also have uh, the guest players of the other leagues coming in and playing as well. So uh, the 2000 and 12s and 11s both play uh, the 2011s play with the 2010s and then the 2012s play with the 2013s in the league which starts this week and then they have their own league starting next month so it would have given them also an advantage for the for their season you know to start a little bit earlier which you'll still have um, but I just think it, 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 it's it's frustrating when you're you're kind of ready and and then you get the notice a day or two before you know no games this weekend. So uh, that was the weekend, but what ended up happening, which I think I would have been able to watch anyway, was the uh, the Manchester City Liverpool game. I was able to watch that. We'll talk about that in kind of the main part of the episode, which is really talking about. Uh, defensive changes during the game um, so that was that was something I really enjoyed doing watching the game analyzing it and that was a lot of fun uh, I also watched some games on Saturday as well which was cool uh, you know another weekend at home though uh, and just really ready to get back into things um, on Saturday games well it's also it happens to be the school season so uh, our players are playing on their school teams and because we also don't have a lot of players that you know our oldest players are 13 so most of our players are either in elementary school or middle school uh, here in Canada uh, so a, a lot of actually our players go to uh, my elementary school uh, which is here and uh I wanted uh, one of the parents told me that there were tryouts and all this and everyone made the team which is I think what should happen in elementary and middle school um, everyone made the team and they had a tournament so I thought hey you know it's uh, Monday and uh, I got nothing else to do <laughs> so uh, let's go watch our players play in this tournament now they were playing 9v9 in a very small field against other players and you know it, it, it's school soccer when it comes to elementary and middle school it's a completely different animal um so the first game i was in there for uh, apparently they got absolutely destroyed and in, in their uh and the teachers they don't have coaches they have teacher coaches they uh they switch players off i think like every three four minutes and the players barely got any playing time uh, consistent playing time so second game I was there and watched and 
they learned from their mistakes, which is what coaches should do and teachers should do. So uh, they ended up having two different uh, lines, uh, one in the first half, one in the second half, and just kind of rotated players, I would say, about every 10 minutes within their lines. So players got to play only half of the game. But it worked a lot better. And what was really cool was seeing gladiator players, right? Players from my academy that are playing in different that are in different parts of their soccer journey. We had uh, two players of ours who are playing for our academy teams, and then we had about three, four who trained with us. Right, they're players that are just kind of starting their soccer journey, and they made their school team because you know everyone makes the school team. So it was really cool to kind of see them all play together. Um, and that was a lot of fun to watch. Now, school soccer is very different. You can't really keep possession. That, that doesn't really work uh, in elementary and middle school because if you have everyone that makes the team, there are, just, there are kids who just really have never touched a soccer ball maybe other than like recess or something. So they don't know how to control. They don't know how to pass. They don't understand positioning and stuff like that. So one of my defenders who I also do private training with, um, his kind of first couple of passes were backwards, right? Which is great in, uh, in our game, right? In, in the way that we play, right? He keeps possession. He gives the ball to the goalkeeper and then he gets wide, supports the ball, gets the ball back in space. So I pretty much told them, you know, this is different. Why don't you, instead of trying to pass it back to a goalkeeper who's never really played a goalkeeper, kick it up, kick it up to one of the other gladiator players. And at that point is really where the 1v1 comes in. So when our defender kicks the ball up, right, bounces through like four or five players, because again, they can't control the ball, uh, these players who have never played. And those ended up being goals because the ball went up and uh, to one of our players who took the ball 1v1 through, I would say, four or five players. Uh, and then they either score or they'd find a different player and make really a through ball pass and, and stuff like that. So it was really cool to watch. They, uh, they're actually playing again today. I don't know if I'll be able to go watch. Uh, they ended up winning their next two games with this kind of new uh, tactic of kind of having half, half. And uh, there were some really interesting players. There were some good players on the team, uh, some big, you know, athletic guys. And uh, it was just, it, it was a lot of fun to watch. And what I actually really loved was the parent support. You know, I knew a lot of the parents because they were gladiator parents. And I know all the parents in my academy. So uh, it was nice to kind of sit, watch, not coach, even though I, I did kind of step in a couple of times and, and coach and talk to the teachers and, you know, l let them know, you know, these are our academy players. If you really want to be successful, you know, uh, you know, you could put one of them, that one in goal, uh, a midfielder, a, def uh, a defender, a forward, and uh, they listened, and you know, it, it, it looked a lot better. Uh, they really dominated the next two games, so that was a lot of fun to watch and and to sit there. Even though, uh, if you are in Ontario right now, you know that it's getting pretty chilly outside, so. Uh, it also rained a little bit, but, you know, the, the kids were laughing and, and having fun. Now, I, I, I do coach a school team. Um, I coach a private school team. And there's a huge difference here. Uh, you know, w when I went to, uh, when we started with the, with the private school, me and, and the other coach in my academy as well, we were, we were told essentially that if you go up by three goals, you know, that's the time to stop scoring. And when, when, you're, when you have a team of players in elementary school or middle school and everyone makes the team and it's like that for everyone, that's the attitude you need to have. And I really appreciate the fact that, you know, it, within these private schools, all the other teams kind of know that. You know, the athletic directors talk to each other. And yesterday, what I saw in the public school system was completely different and made me really upset. 
I also got a call yesterday from a kid that didn't make the team, and he was so upset. You know, and, and we're not talking about high school students. High school is completely different. I get that, but if you're in, you know, four, five, four, fourth, and fifth grade, which is what these kids are, and you're not making your school team, uh, I don't know. I mean, we're talking about under ten, and we're not even talking about a competitive atmosphere, right? We're not even like it's just not the way it should be. So yesterday, there there was a coach and. Uh, for one of the teams our school was playing against not the private i'm talking about the public um and his whole pre-game talk was about goal difference and scoring and defending and making sure that they don't score on us and all this and here's what happens with that if you put the pressure on the kids to win they go on the field and Denlo, which is the school that I went to and our players go to, uh, ended up being up four five zero. Suddenly, the players that were now spoken, the other team, about having to win, if they don't win, they don't make the next round, those types of conversations in the pregame, they're frustrated. And a 10-year-old who is very frustrated, a lot of the time, is going to resort to violence. You know, to kind of get their frustrations out. And that's what happened. They, one of the players just pushed one of our players. And, and we see this a lot in our games as well. Um, and it just kind of clicked yesterday. I think that's why there are violence. And, and that's why teams that play against us are a lot more violent than they would be with someone else. Because it's frustrating. You know, the coach puts so much pressure on them to not get beat, to not lose the game. And if you're not seeing the ball because we're a possession-based team, if you're getting beat 1v1 every time, and on top of that, the other team is scoring, you're going to get frustrated, especially as a 9, 10-year-old. And the only thing that you can do, other than, you know, cry and, and all that, is trip, push, verbally you know, say things, and, and that's what our players face, you know, and, and it's a problem with coaches. It's a problem with the expectations going on to the field. A, a, again, and I say this all the time, I, I, I want our players to win, don't get me wrong, but my talks are never about winning. My talks, it, it's not about go out and win. The players, when they show up, they know, you know, they should want to go out and win. That, that has nothing to do with me. My job is to develop them. So we talk about what success looks like in the pregame talks, right? We talk about during halftime, we talk about how does the other team play? Are there any changes that we can make to be better, right? But it's not score more goals. It's not, you know, it, it, it's not that kind of attitude that the other coach had. And he was yelling, and it was just, what a terrible, and this is an athletic director. Um, it, very frustrating to see. Uh, I spoke to one of the other athletic directors, and, and she kind of echoed that point as well. So, I don't know. It, it's tough to see kids having to go through that. And the kid came off, their goalkeeper, um, and, he, and he was crying. You know, because Denlo, our school, they were winning 4-0. And after every goal, his teammates, they were saying, it's your fault. Why didn't you stop it? He went and, you know, I I, I heard I kind of talked to the kid. And then I said, you know, go tell your coach. And then the coach starts defending his players. That's not okay. You know, a, a kid is upset because others were telling him he was terrible. He's not a soccer player. None of them are soccer players. The coach is talking about tactics and this and that. Ugh. To be a good coach, you have to understand your audience. And, and that's just not, that's not a coaching lesson. That's a life skill, you know. You have to understand who you're talking to. I guarantee that I speak differently around my friends than I do... You know, around parents and things like that. It's you, you, you speak differently at work, right? You say things differently 
because of your surroundings and if you're working with kids it's a different type of atmosphere when i was a camper um i i went to sleep over camp for a very long time and i had uh the same couple of counselors with me uh throughout and they were they were like second parents i mean you're when you're gone for summer camp you're gone for two months and these people are you know the adults that are really affecting you and the whole faculty uh the whole staff faculty um they you know they become people you look up to and i remember the summer that i became staff and i went to my very first staff party and i saw things that shocked me staff that i grew up with knowing were smoking they were drinking and i couldn't handle it i couldn't handle the fact that they were so different than what i thought i knew about these people but that's how it should be you know in the atmosphere that you are in you have responsibilities and if you are coaching six and seven and eight and nine and ten year olds you you can't you can't be yelling you have to be looking out not just for their soccer needs but their emotional needs and it's a big job and that's what in my opinion makes good coaches versus bad coaches so i was i I was very disappointed watching that um you know I, i can't even think about what the coach said on the way home after they lost two games and didn't win um yeah i don't i don't know uh it's frustrating but you know uh, i i open the academy to make a difference and and that's what i want to do i want to make a difference in my players lives i want to make sure they have a really good experience and uh having said that that brings me to last night (laughs) i have said this and will continue to say it i'm not a political person yet when we have a district meeting I am usually the one that ends up talking. I just talk and talk and it's because I care. And yesterday we had a meeting and uh, something big is happening. And I don't know how I feel about it yet. So let's talk it out. We're part of one of the smallest districts here in Ontario. Uh, It's called the North York Soccer Association um, and it's the North York District. For those, let's let's get into a little bit of geography. So there's Toronto, which is uh, the south, the most south you can go. The Toronto Soccer Association, the Toronto District. Then north of them is us. We are the North York Soccer Association. And then even north of that is York Region. That's where two of my teams are playing this winter. Then on one side is Scarborough uh, and Durham. And then on the other side uh, is something else, which we don't need to talk about because they're not part of this. So essentially what's happening is us, Toronto, and Scarborough are essentially joining up starting in the summer and creating this kind of mega district, you know, like a district which was three different districts and we're coming together to kind of create this one big large district so the question remains <laughs> is this good is this bad is this ugly and the answer is yes it is good yes it is bad yes it is ugly it is all of those things and i will go through each one it is good because tsa is very strong toronto soccer association and scarborough has some really good teams as well so Bringing us all together under one umbrella is, one, going to allow us to have more teams, right? Which the reason I'm going north with two of my teams is because it doesn't exist in North York. So we have to travel, which I hate traveling with my teams because they're so young. I shouldn't have to travel. So it's going to allow competition to stay within our district which is great it's also going to give us many more options we'll have different tiers that we can go into uh, and and that's going to be really good and on top of that 
we're not going to need to get into provincial leagues and things like that before we're ready because the competition is going to be very high here. So I think these are all really good things. Now, the bad part about this is that we're losing power. What I really liked about our small district is that we were able to have meetings like we did last night and we were able to make changes if we didn't like something. And now that's not going to be possible. The way it works here in Canada is based on the number of members that you have. That gives you a certain amount of voting power. And clubs that have thousands of players, which exists here, they pretty much have all the power within their district to make changes. And districts that are larger have more power, you know, and that's just the way it is. So for us, one coming together will bring more power, but we won't really be able to, I won't really be able to affect changes in the league and really raise my concerns as much as I was last time. I won't be able to be heard as much. Right? When you have 200 teams, it's different than when you have only about 50. So that's kind of the bad part about it. And that's really why I opened the academy, to be able to affect change in soccer in this country. And it seems like with this change in bringing these districts together, my ability to change things positively... Uh, is is not going to be as possible as it was before now i can still do things in my own academy don't get me wrong but you know we were able to have some really good discussions and uh make up our minds at the end of it and and i just don't think that's going to happen now the ugly is we don't know anything we don't know what's going to happen we don't know how this is going to really affect things. It's just kind of, there's a lot of bad blood and history behind how districts feel towards each other. So there's some real ugliness in the way that people saw other districts there's a very certain type of stigma within North York that we're weak and all that. And TSA is just kind of doing always their own thing. So there's lots of stigmas. So that's been really ugly. And hopefully bringing these districts together is really going to help mend that. And, and, and that's hopefully going to be good. So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, it'll be in the summer. Um, they're going to try it, see what happens. And, uh, as always, I will keep you posted, <laughs> uh, as I always do. Now, I do want to say, though, with all this, this has really been a blessing for us. We're a new academy, and we're going to be new for a very long time. Most of the teams around here, even in North York, I played against them growing up. So in 10 years, we're still going to be the new guys on the block. So for us, as an academy that's just starting, it's been really good to be in what is can considered a very weak district because it allows our teams to really build up and i think this is really going to be the first year that we're putting in a u9 team that we've had more than two i would say more than one player that we've had for more than a year our u9s we've had a great u8 program um but a lot of that has been disrupted by covid so this is going to be a really interesting 2014 year because we just have some players that are very gladiator-like. And these are players... The, the problem I'll, I'll say with our old, 2000, our old U9 team, which is our 2012s, is they're a fantastic team. And I would say they're probably our best team. But... When they were U9s and U8s, they didn't really have anyone to challenge them. If you were the best player in U9 or U8 on our team, there wasn't anyone else above you to kind of play. With their 2014s, a lot of them have 
been playing with the 2012. Some of them have been playing with the 2013s. So we've been really pushing them. And they are now very, very strong. And I mean that mentally. They they do not give up. And it's a gladiator type of personality that I'm excited about. And this is really the first gladiator group where top to bottom no one is scared they will go and they will battle so unbelievably hard and they won't give up it it, it doesn't matter and i know this even before the season starts if we are down 10-0 they will go in hard and they will not care they will take you on 1v1 over and over and over again and we have some absolutely brilliant players that have been playing two years up uh some of them have been playing with us there's two players that have been playing with us for about two to three years now and i'm just excited to see how this team does again are we going to win probably not but the games are going to be beautiful and they're going to be beautiful because we're going to be playing gladiator soccer and that's what i'm excited about so yeah that's kind of where we are right now um let's talk about uh defensive changes during the game (laughs) so on sunday uh, Liverpool against Manchester City. Great game? Question mark. No, it, it was a really intense game, and uh, what I what I noticed, and when you're analyzing the game, uh, City played in a three two four, three two five, something like that, um, or a three two two three, something like that. Uh, and just kind of analyzing throughout the game, I noticed that Liverpool had a lot of possession in the final third. And they were winning balls there and things like that. And it just kind of clicked that that's where City needed to focus. And they made that change and kind of had that fourth player come back. Uh, and it changed the game at that point. But... For me, watching that game, it was pretty clear that that's what you should be watching out for in the game. And let me make this a little bit more clear. When you're watching and and when you're watching a game as you're coaching, it's very tough to make changes because you're focused on your team, you're focused on your players. It's hard to focus on your team, your players, and the other team, seeing what their formation is and stuff like that. So I want to make it really simple as to how you can make little tweaks to really get your defensive structure better. What you should be looking out for is you should be looking out for where the other team has the most possession. For example, if the other team that you're playing against, if they have most of their possession in their third, that means that that is where you lack players. That means they probably have an advantage there. Or definitely have an advantage there. Now that advantage could be number of players. That advantage could be their players are just more technically and tactically better. Which is something that sometimes happens. You know, we've played against teams that, you know, technically they were better than us. Right? Tactically some teams have been better than us. And then some teams just overload certain situations with players. And you have to understand that. And you have to say, okay, if they are keeping possession in a certain part of the field the first question you have to ask yourself are you okay with it am i okay if they're keeping possession in their final third in in their third probably i I don't care i'm not gonna suddenly change it unless i really want to press hard and i really want to uh play counter attack and play in there and, and win the ball as close to their net as possible which is a really good strategy by the way you know but if they're keeping possession in our half in our final third that's an issue and that needs to be fixed right that probably means that they're overloading i would say they're forwards or if they're keeping the ball in the middle right they're overloading the middle so you have to make certain tweaks and bring players from other positions and other lines into that so that in that situation you are now trying to make things even so here's what I noticed. I noticed in Liverpool and City that they were keeping possession a lot 
and they were getting a lot more chances than City. So they were keeping the ball in City's final third. And why was that? Because Pep made the decision to play a back three. Now, I'm not Pep. I'm not going to disagree with Pep. No, <laughs> I'm not even close to his level. Okay, this is just what I noticed, right? So he probably had a back three because he wanted to keep certain players in certain situations. So by bringing us a, uh, a full back up into uh, maybe an inverted position or something else, it allowed another player to push up. So they were able to, uh, in his mind at least, keep possession in certain parts of the game. So I I'm not here to argue that. But when I noticed that they were keeping possession in City's final third a lot more, how would you fix that? For me, instead of having that back three, go back to that back four, right? If that's something that you want to change, who knows? Maybe that was part of his plan to give them the space in the final third and then to counterattack really quickly. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know what the game plan was. But that, I think, is a really important part. Can you just reflect on how things are going? Do they have more possession? If so, where? Are they playing on the right wing a lot? Maybe they have a really fast, 1v1 proficient player. And all they're doing is getting him the ball. And he's just, that's where the ball is always, on the right side. What can you do? Well, maybe if you're playing... Let's say a 4 4 2. Maybe the two center mids are now going to shift more to that side a little bit more to give you some more numbers in that situation. So you have to look at kind of the overall picture, see where the possession is, and change it, right? And that's kind of an on the fly way I think of doing it without having to go, okay, they're playing a 4 3 3. We're playing a 4 4 2, which means that we have an advantage uh, in the middle because we're we're sorry they have an advantage in the middle because they have three players in the center space and we only have two so how do i that's you're not gonna have time to do that especially in the youth game where you know you're not gonna have someone in your ear being like i was actually watching from the bleachers and here's what i'm seeing like you're not gonna get that you're not gonna get you know uh someone watching like it's it's not gonna happen so i think this is a really good way to just kind of be like okay here's how we can change things just before I end the show, I wanted to talk a little bit about Shark Attack and how amazing our kind of new adaptation of it is. And, and I'll go over this really quick, but essentially um, all the sharks are in a grid and every player has a ball and your job is to kick someone else's ball out of the grid. Once you do that, then their ball is out for good and we play for the last two balls standing. So if you don't have a ball, you go and you steal someone else's ball, essentially. It is such an amazing warm-up game. And if you haven't tried it, I urge you to try it. And I'll tell you why it's really good. The beginning of the game is very slow in that there isn't much going on. We have players kind of hesitant to start. As the game progresses players start to kind of get a little bit more into it you start to see skill moves like Cruyff turns and shielding which we go over both of those in between rounds shielding and Cruyff turns Cruyff turn let's just talk about it really quick player stands beside the ball both feet together um, take one step away as wide as your shoulders get low uh, arm comes up furthest arm from the ball uh, furthest arm from the ball goes up into a shielding position closest foot to the ball steps in front of the ball you turn your foot that's now in front of the ball into a pigeon position so we say pigeon and penguin so pigeon is when your toes are pointed in penguin is when your toes are pointed out okay so if you can try and kind of imagine that as they're walking so in front of the ball pigeon your foot and then you penguin pass away that's a corif turn that's how we teach it so what happens is once the first ball is kicked out now you've got players without the ball coming in to try and steal the ball now what we've done in the past is just trying to kick someone else's ball away while keeping possession of yours and that's great that's part of shark attack we still do that a lot of the time but this adds an element of an actual defender coming at you 
trying to win the ball, not just kick it away, actually win the ball, which is very game-like. And then on top of that, the more the game progresses, the less players have a ball. So there are situations sometimes where you're trying to get away from three players, two players, two defenders, and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to share that with you. If you haven't tried it, try it. Just try it. It takes all of four minutes, right? Worst comes to worst, you don't like it. But the best thing that can come out of this for you is that this can really be a really great way to get the kids started in a session, really warmed up and just ready to play, focused, ready to go, dialed in. And it's a really great development game that we absolutely love. <laughs> Lastly, uh, I did get a hold of VO and I did uh, get a new discount code and I did get a bigger discount code. So before it was $100 and now it is $200 off your VO2 if you are interested. Uh, the link is going to be in the show notes and on the website and in kind of all that um, because it is not just a discount code. It is now a link that'll take you directly there. Um, it's uh, go.vo.co uh, sorry slash lp slash coaching dash soccer dash weekly so that'll all be in the show notes moving forward uh, and if you are looking to get $200 off the new VO uh, then you can do that through us thanks for listening to another episode of coaching soccer weekly even though I'm not having games during the weekend it's kind of working out because I have a very busy week so Actually, this will be the last week of school soccer. And then once that's over, we'll start playing in our game. So really excited to get back into our season. And actually super excited to see that 2014 team play. Uh, that's really what I'm looking forward to. It's just kind of years of working with some of those players just to be able to now see them in the league. So I'm excited to see how they do. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm really interested to see how this whole mega league is going to turn out. So I'll definitely keep you posted as new things come up. And next week, again, we don't have games. So uh, we'll see what I talk about. So until next week, enjoy the journey. Enjoy the moments. But most importantly, enjoy the game. Coaching Soccer Weekly is a production of World Class Coaching. All rights reserved.